Since its inception, America has had a diverse history. From the Middle Passage to the middle of a pandemic, black people have been a significant part of it. But the teaching of American history has traveled two paths. One history is absorbed by simply existing. It is ever present in everything we do and taught through all levels of education. The other is significantly undertaught, if at all, and remains a subject that most must seek on their own to learn. What do we want? Justice! This is what it looks like when you're on the right side of history. But 2020 made more people realize that undertaught history might help explain how we got to this crossroad today. It's still uncomfortable for many, but we can't make sense of our nation's problems with race if we don't know the complete history behind it. So tonight, we'll focus on the success, but also the struggle and the work that still needs to be done. Because it's not just black history. This is American history. This is history for all. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Tonight we want to continue the conversation about race in our country, where we've been, where we are, and where we need to go next. Over the next hour, we're going to take a closer look at systemic racism, its roots, and how it persists today. Rethinking what we think we know about our history and the changes already underway in this last year of what many hope has been an awakening. Black History Month began as a week in 1926, pushed by Harvard historian Carter Woodson after he witnessed how black people were underrepresented in history, in the books, and in the conversations that shaped the study of American history. In fact, he once said, if a race has no history or tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world and stands in danger of being exterminated. The week was officially recognized as a month in 1976. When people say to me, well, why Black History Month? Well, we, we just want equity um, and equality and, and appreciation for um, the, no, the, the, the fact that Black folk have played a significant role in what we call today the United States of America. White people have also played a significant role in the United States, but why is there no White History Month? There's no White History Month because most history that's taught is white history or a version of white history. And so you see, you know, white people in all the historical context, you see them in statues and books and textbooks. White folk, um, quite frankly, control the institutions, um, whether it's public schools or colleges and universities or government, um, they control that narrative. It's a narrative that many would argue leaves parts of history involving blacks untold or unacknowledged, especially when it comes to violence and white people being the aggressors. One such example is the 1943 race riots in Detroit. The stories of the 1960s riots were everywhere, sort of pervasive. Lots of people I knew you know, had lived through them. Um, but the stories of the 1940s riots weren't. Those are a very different situation, right? In 1943, you get uh, a, a kind of violence that's very common across the country in its history of mostly white people striking out at and destroying black property and black lives. And that's a sort of recurrent theme in American history from the moment of the end of slavery, if you, depending on how you count the moments before that. And so um, I think that history is not taught very well if it's taught at all. It was incredible to read that and realize that I'd lived in this area my whole life and never really read that story. And it's, it's hard to make sense out of what happened in 1967, say, without knowing what happened in 1943 and the years in between. 2020 became a year of social justice movements. Was the call for change booming louder or were more people finally listening? That question remains unanswered. Will the renewed quest for racial equality evolve into real, lasting reforms? What's his name? George Floyd! What's his name? George Floyd! What was it about George Floyd? What's going on? Was it the video? The horrible, unavoidable evidence of watching a man die in real time? Why did the outrage finally reach critical mass? Why didn't that happen, say, in 1958 in Milwaukee? That February night when police pulled over Daniel Bell for a broken taillight. Moments after the stop, Bell was dead, shot by an officer who claimed that Bell had a knife, a knife that facts would later reveal had been planted by the officer. Why didn't Daniel Bell 
make a nation rise up in anger. We have a pandemic in our community of black people being killed. Not just Bell, so many others from long ago and from just last year. What was it about George Floyd? That there was video? No, there's been plenty of video. Like that of Eric Garner, who, like Floyd, pleaded with the officers that he couldn't breathe. Why was George Floyd's death different? Well, no doubt 2020 had something to do with it. Governor Gretchen Whitmer declaring a state of emergency in Michigan after announcing there are now the two first confirmed cases of the virus in our state. Communities of color were suddenly under intense assault from a virus that was exposing massive fissures in American health care. In Detroit, it was hard to miss the skin color in the obituaries of those taken by COVID-19 in that awful early surge. We want justice. And after George Floyd's life had been extinguished, the stories and the videos just kept coming. It's not fair. And locked inside and away from others by the pandemic, it seemed the streets were the only place to take the frustration. But something else was afoot, too. African Americans are far too acquainted with the rituals of the protest march, the chants, the songs. But new faces and new voices were arriving to take part. A youth movement, sure, but a diverse one. And marches were no longer confined to the well-worn streets of Detroit. Cities, suburbs, and little towns all over the country became unfamiliar venues for civic anger. Now to be sure, there were bursts of violence and moments of vandalism and looting that in the long run damaged the cause for which the majority of these protesters were laboring. The mayhem at times threatening to drown out the message. But we were also treated to scenes like these, in which police officers stood side by side with the marchers to say that they too want change in America and at the intersection of law enforcement and color. Yes, it looked quite different for so many reasons. And yet just one measure will tell us in the long run how different it actually is. The measure of change. And one place to start that measure of change are schools. There's been an ongoing debate in the educational system over who's writing the stories of American history and how those stories shape the views of our nation's children. Many historians and educators say they're concerned about revisionism and the whitewashing of history and its direct ties to systemic racism. Paula Tutman assembled a group of experts to start the discussion on changes needed and how history is taught in our school system. At the Anamdi Center for Contemporary Art in Detroit, Izebe Anamdi is preparing to install a new exhibit opening in two days. And it is White History Month, volume one and two. The exhibit is just one answer to what the 40-year-old gallery deems as necessary to push a desire for global perspective through art. And Izebe is acutely aware that the other bridge to becoming that more perfect union the framers of the United States speak of is treating students as explorers beyond their own cultural backyards. They may not go to Africa, they may not go to Europe, islands or what have you, but if they become explorers, when you teach them to explore kind of intellect or desire, when they seek that knowledge, then what happens, they end up learning this global life right there where they are. How do you solve a problem called systemic racism? Many who have long studied the deep divides that have been a 100,000 horsepowered engine in this nation believe the driving force must be in changing the way we teach history in our classrooms. Dr. Nikolai Viti is the superintendent of the Detroit Public Schools Community District. There's this growing of white supremacy um, of these white power movements, and, and I partially blame our schools for that. I think if we taught it at a very young age and, and allowed uh, white people in this country to understand what white privilege means and, and uh, what whiteness means, we can deconstruct that 
and have different conversations and different relationships moving forward. Neil Barclay is the CEO of the Wright Museum of African American History. The impulse uh, for teaching um, for the last, you know, five decades or so has been about telling a nice story, right? About the American dream, about American values, and trying to spin everything so that it everybody made nice, you know, Thanksgiving with the pilgrims and the Indians it was such a lovely story, wasn't it? You know, but what has happened because of that is that people have grown up not understanding the reality and the real story of what was happening at various times in our history. Professor Erin Dwyer is with the Department of History at Oakland University, and she says incorporating that one chapter on slavery and Martin Luther King Jr. and perhaps Harriet Tubman, you know, since the movie came out, is simply a short change of the rich, good and bad that built this nation. And it has given cover to a legacy that continues to shape the United States. People and, and white people in particular have to be willing to sit with discomfort in discussions about uh, race relations uh, and the history of, of racism in America and, and how that uh, uh, has allowed systemic racism to accrue over centuries. Its roots you know, are, are linked to slavery uh, that, that have perpetuated the history of this country from politics to job opportunities to incarceration to, you know, uh, police brutality. Uh, it's all linked to that. Hands up! Oh, yeah. ah. Get up and get in the car! Mama! Get up and get Mama. in the car right! This may be a lot of things, this moment we're living through, but it is definitely not about black lives. And remember that when they come for you, and at this rate, they will. I'm gonna tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. And unless you teach it directly, um, even if it's uncomfortable, you know, even if you have to look at yourself and look at your family differently, that's the only way we're going to get to the other side of racism in this country. Which brings us to why there must be an expansion of history taught at the beginning of learning and throughout education. Margaret Schultz is the director of instructional equity in the Bloomfield Hills School District. Only some people get to actually write the history. And so we have to go back and figure out, um, you know, through um, primary source documents and different storytellings that have happened throughout the years to really, really kind of get a grasp on what actually happened. If we could get on the record the complete narrative, which recognizes this side of the story and that side of the story, people will begin to understand, you know, while that's not my lived experience, I now understand that there's all these people that I know, that I live with, that I work with, that are operating the society, who've had a completely different experience with the American ideal. We need to make sure that we are teaching a true history, um, including all perspectives, in everything that we do. But it's also important that we highlight and center those voices that have been historically marginalized in our country and in many ways erased or looked over for, for centuries. And I see this as an issue with, with women's history as well, that there can often be a sense of, of adding in, kind of history as an additive. We'll sprinkle in a little uh, African-American history as a treat um, instead of seeing that it's at the core uh, of American history. Because when children can see themselves as well as people who do not look like them as part of their history, it becomes just history. Usually when you are having difficulty accepting others, they're actually shining something back on you about you. When you're able to start accepting those differences, you start accepting your differences. So here's your pop quiz. Who is Selma Burke and what is the name of the man who invented the gas mask as well as the street light? Here's your answer. It's not in this book. Now there are districts like Detroit and Bloomfield Hills changing the way they're teaching history, including more diverse stories with different ethnicities and their contributions. But the challenge is for that to happen in districts where there is less ethnic diversity because that is where the full history is sorely needed. Back to you.
All right, Paula, thank you. You know, another problem is there aren't any national social studies standards, so what children are learning in grade school really varies from state to state, with some states not even ever mentioning slavery or the civil rights movement. It can always be difficult to get communities and then broaden that out to cities and states to yeah. agree on those kind of standards. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, that's our goal tonight, inspiring dialogue and a greater understanding of race and equity in our society. Coming up, the importance of uncomfortable conversations about race. Detroit was codenamed Midnight along the Underground Railroad. You'll hear from a woman whose ancestor was a conductor to get slaves safely into Canada. And pay close attention to how President Obama greets this basketball team. What he's doing, some say, helped him succeed. Next, we'll explain code switching, why it's done, and the toll it can take on people of color. I want the healthcare system to understand that its real job is to improve the health of the community in total. And in order to do that, they need to represent the community. Welcome back. It's defined as the ability to switch between languages in a single conversation. It's called code switching, and we all do it to some degree. For instance, you may speak more casually at home the way you do at work. But for black people, code switching is far more complex and can often be taxing. Some would argue the ability to do it well is a prerequisite to success. You want to make some money here? Use your white boys. Code switching is something many black people are all too familiar with. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. As soon as we hear someone speak, our minds automatically make associations about where they're from geographically. We also make assumptions about their education level, their income level. Miles Durkee has done extensive research on racial code switching as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Code switching, I describe it as a double-edged sword where there's definitely there's benefits and advantages, but there are also serious costs and consequences. For example, when a black person doesn't or can't effectively code switch, the result can be damaging. Case in point, the star witness in the 2013 George Zimmerman trial. I had told you. Rachel Jean Tell was on the phone with Trayvon Martin moments before he was killed. I had asked him how the man looked like. He looked like a creepy prepper. When she spoke in court, it was clear the 19-year-old's testimony was largely being judged on her mannerisms and style of speaking. Ultimately, George Zimmerman walked free. They have even said, you know, that it's a survival technique, you know. Yes. And maybe it's, it's saved their lives in some situations. Interacting with the police is a clear example where code switching can be the difference between life or death. If an officer already perceives a black male as threatening, I mean, code switching is an extremely effective way to help alleviate some of that anxiety. But code switching is not just in the way a person speaks. It can also involve your entire behavioral profile, from hairstyles to clothing and the way in which you carry yourself. Former President Barack Obama's effective ability to code switch has been well documented. And you go through a whole game. When he was meeting the um, dream team. And you can see his handshake differs simply based on the race of who he's, you know, uh, greeting. Uh, so you see with uh, white individuals in the coaching staff, it's a very standard, you know, American handshake. But when it's uh, black players on the team, he's more like dapping it up with the players. For many black people, though, constantly focusing on changing themselves in order to make white people feel comfortable can be exhausting and unhealthy. Those who tend to code switch more frequently also report significantly more workplace fatigue and burnout from their current positions, simply because they have to be a different person and mask all the cultural assets that they probably value and appreciate internally, but they realize that those same traits aren't valued in their workplace. And while it can be exhausting, Omari Keels wouldn't go so far as to call it inauthentic because he says it's such a huge part of the Black American experience. I don't see it as a burden anymore. I just see it as something that is a part of who I am, a part of how I navigate this world. You're aware that this is Shawnice Battle says she didn't always know what it was called, but first noticed code switching at a very young Young age. I just know when my mom spoke to certain people, she did it. And when my friends in school spoke to certain people, they did it. I just thought it was a part of being an adult, not like this thing that was specific to my race. Do you feel that it is an authentic part of you or that you're not being authentic when you use that voice? So I think that that is definitely um, a question that I've grappled with and thought about for a really long time. 
Um, because it, it, especially when I initially found out what it was, I'm like, oh my God, this is not me. I'm just switching because I'm in this environment and I'm using this completely different voice. And this is not who I am at all. Also, for the person whose code switching is always activated, it still sometimes isn't enough to overcome racism. So what can we do, especially in the workplace, to make sure marginalized groups can be their authentic self? We also need representation all the way up hierarchical um, ladder of leadership in the organization as well where individuals from underrepresented backgrounds can start to have a voice to start to dictate what that corporate culture looks like. And Dr. Durkee continues his research on code switching, including the psychological implications. We put a link to his latest presentation on our website. Just go to clickondetroit.com and head to the Black History section. Great look at that. Now, have you heard of HBCUs? These are historically black colleges and universities, a source of great pride for many black Americans. However, the history behind why they were needed is a source of pride for no one. Larry Spruill explains. The debate over which is better, historically black colleges and universities or predominantly white institutions, used to be a huge discussion within the black community. But to understand that argument, you first need to understand why HBCUs exist in the first place. During slavery, blacks were prohibited by law from reading and writing. If caught, they often suffered severe punishment from being whipped to the amputation of fingers and toes. Most HBCUs were founded after the Civil War, but even after slavery ended, most races were still segregated. The overwhelming majority of PWIs completely disqualified or limited black people from attending. HBCUs, on the other hand, have always welcomed white enrollment. If PWIs did allow blacks, they were not treated with the same respect, support, and fairness as their fellow white students. HBCUs were often the only paths to a college degree for blacks, and about 100 of them still remain today. Many people who graduated from the HBCU say being treated with respect, support, and fairness helped them graduate with confidence and a sense of identity also preparing them to assimilate in a majority white world if they choose. Both schools are capable of producing successful black citizens who give positive contributions to society. Howard University alumnus Thurgood Marshall was the leading architect of the strategy that ended state-sponsored segregation and chipped away Jim Crow laws in higher education in the landmark case Brown versus Board of Education. Kamala Harris, Stacey Abrams, Martin Luther King Jr., all graduated from a historically black college. So the choice to attend an HBCU or a PWI is really just that, your choice. The debate is now over. There are no HBCUs in the state of Michigan, but there are many opportunities for local students of any race to visit and attend any of the 101 HBCUs around the country. NASCAR, Eskimo Pies, Uncle Ben's, corporate America starting to make changes. The symbols of racism, why it's important to really see and understand them, and the hurt they cause. How Detroit and some of its prominent black leaders played an important role in the fight against slavery. Hear the incredible stories of local heroes of the Underground Railroad coming up next. The Underground Railroad, the dangerous path to freedom for slaves, and it ran right through Metro Detroit before heading into Canada. Places you drive past, landmarks of that railroad and how African Americans made their way to liberty still there. Our Rhonda Walker shows us a few of those stops and introduces us to a woman fiercely proud of her family's role in the Underground Railroad. Detroit was pivotal as a gateway to freedom for over 50,000 slaves. But what you may not know is the role that prominent black Detroit leaders played. They were known as conductors. They risked their lives, they risked their freedom to smuggle fugitive slaves to Detroit, across the Detroit River, and into Canada to freedom. William Lambert was a prominent Detroit conductor and an unsung hero. His work was the roots of the first black Episcopal church, St. Matthew's in Detroit, the NAACP, black Greek fraternal organizations, and starting the first schools to educate black Detroit children. 
Author and family historian Christina Napier, born here in Detroit, is William Lambert's great-granddaughter, three times removed. One of the second wealthiest black men in the state of Michigan at the time purchased 40 false bottom wagons to help transport people between 1829 and 1862. They were always being looked for or hunted. He prepared a speech that he spoke before the Michigan legislature for freedoms for black men, for the right to vote. To take the word white out of the state's constitution. Uh, he was that powerful. He spoke those words a hundred years before the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Fills me with so much pride. Physically hide slaves in his own home. That once stood near downtown at the corner of Larned and St. Aubin. Sadly, thieves stole the historic marker. Stole it for scrap, which is so sad. I mean, when I first found that out, I was enraged to have a children's book that I've written about William Lambert so that they can make sure that that the story continues. The story of George de Baptiste, another prominent black Detroit conductor, is at his home site marker. You may have driven past it, East Larned in Bobian downtown. He had the means to purchase a steamboat to smuggle countless slaves to Canada. De Baptiste pointing towards Windsor on the riverfront gateway to freedom sculpture in Hart Plaza. Did you know? Directly across on the Windsor side, there is the Tower of Freedom sculpture. The first stop for food, clothes, and shelter on the Canadian side, the home of John Freeman Walls. He escaped to freedom on the Underground Railroad and built this log cabin. My great-grandmother was uh, born in a log cabin. And when she turned 100, the Canadian government uh, turned it into a historic site. The family maintains as a museum for tours its chapel named after Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks used to go there uh, to visit and she said that that was where she felt the most at home. We often talk about the ties that bind uh, in the African-American community. Uh, the sculpture both in Detroit and in Windsor ties that story together and it's something that a lot of Detroiters don't know. So, the next time you're downtown and see an historic marker, stop for an inspiring history lesson. I'm Rhonda Walker, back to you. Rhonda actually discovered a historic marker of the Underground Railroad while walking with some friends last summer. You can see her special report on a farmhouse in Riley Park right now on our website. Just go to clickondetroit.com. You know, Motown didn't just create music for our soul. It began as a black-owned record label that broke racial barriers and put Detroit on the world stage in a new way. Tonight, how Hitsville, USA is empowering new artists. I hope I'm, I'm saving lives. That's the most important thing I ever wanted to do in medicine, is to save lives. 2020 brought new calls to end social injustice and systemic racism. We saw some signs of change at the corporate level. Our Steve Garagiola shows us why it's important to really see and understand the symbols of racism. Sometimes the pain and injury of racism is easy to see but not so easy to see when it's hiding in plain sight, at sporting events, on television, and even your own kitchen. Over the past 12 months, we've seen the beginnings of an awakening to racism in America, evident in protests all around the country this past summer. We have also seen a response from corporate America. NASCAR has banned the Confederate flag at its events. The Washington Redskins are now the Washington football team as they consider ideas for a new name. Dryers will no longer call its chocolate-coated ice cream bars Eskimo Pies. And gone forever are Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima. Why are these changes important? Because symbols matter in, in our society, but it especially matters when it is coupled with uh, action. African American. Dr. David Pilgrim is curator of the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia at Ferris State University in Big Rapids. Thousands of artifacts that tell the long and painful story of racism in America. We use uh, objects of intolerance to teach tolerance and promote social justice to document 
uh, what happened in the past uh, and to uh, use those objects to facilitate intelligent discussions about race, race relations, and racism. We each see the world colored by our own perspective. And there are many people who don't understand why all the fuss over these symbols. They think this is nostalgic, right? These are warm feelings, warm memories about the past. But for many others, there is nothing warm or nostalgic about these caricatures. They are reminded of enslavement and Jim Crow. So if we see things so differently, how do we continue to make meaningful change? Dr. Pilgrim believes it's not so much what we're doing as it is what we're not doing. The thing that we're not doing in this country right now, we're not having conversations where people can disagree, where they can listen to others. I'd like to see everyone in this country having meaningful, deep, even painful discussions about, about race. Then who will drive our evolution toward true equality and social justice? I used to say to people that young people were our best resource. They were our best chance. And now I believe they're our only chance. All right, Steve, it is a recurring theme we're hearing that we have to have difficult conversations about race. That can be a really hard thing to do. It can be scary. It can be intimidating. Maybe for some facing a few truths in our family tree, we'd rather not. Question is, how do we start? Let's have a conversation now about the way forward for white people and engaging white people in the race conversation. And I'm joined by two very familiar faces, former Detroit City Council Member Sheila Cockrell and the head of Focus Hope, uh, Portia Roberson. When you start to expand the conversation out uh, and you start trying to enlist people who maybe, Sheila, haven't been a part of that conversation before, that is where real progress is going to be made, isn't it? It's not among people who talk about race all the time. we got to engage people who don't. Right. But I think even for people who do talk about race and are comfortable in talking about race, understanding white privilege and systemic institutional racism is bigger than having the kind of conversations about race that we've all had in the past. It really is a hard conversation, I think, for white folks to have. You have people who don't who aren't really successful, who if you say to them, yeah, you got white privilege, their thing will be privilege. I don't have any kind of privilege. I'm working two jobs and I can barely keep above water. So having the structural conversation is something that I frankly don't think any group of white folks are exempt from having to have. Portia, I, I, I know that Sheila feels that if, if this conversation is comfortable, it's not getting anywhere. I'm, I'm gonna agree that maybe you feel the same way, Portia. This, is, this has to be a difficult conversation to have. It has to be a difficult conversation. And it is not a conversation where I think too often white folks have felt that we were asking them to take responsibility for something that they didn't want to be responsible for because it didn't happen. They didn't do it. You know, that was my great, great grandfather that did that. It's not my, and it's not about um, us asking for you to say, I'm sorry on their behalf. It, in fact, I think it's less about that and more about where you are right now and what things have you benefited from that may have happened with your great, great grandfather that you can actually change now so that it does not continue or you do not continue to feel like we are looking for an apology from you for things that are going to happen 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now. This conversation has to happen because it is the Achilles heel of the United States of America that there is this unexamined structural racism that's impacted everybody. So I, we have, we have, there's an investment that needs to be made because it's required. So how do we engage people to talk about something when it feels um, nuclear to a lot of white people? Why, why, why should I get in that conversation? What's in it for me? So I mean, there's a lot of history learning we need to do. What were we all ta taught about Reconstruction and Jim Crow? What do we really understand about what happened in our country after the Civil War? So uh, the zero tolerance that we've kind of arrived at, is, is, that, is, it, is that, would you say, yeah, it's about time or is that going a little too far? Well, I mean, I think zero tolerance for the N-word, I personally have enforced that with my, when my daughter was younger, with she and her friends, both black and white that term is not going to be used in my car, in my presence. So there's no, I don't condone the notion of there's a familiar way for black folks to use that term that's okay and that white folks shouldn't. Nobody should use it because it's got a particular history. 
I agree with Sheila. I don't think there's a context for it in any capacity. I think it's too weighted a word for people to try to use it in a educational sense and not understand that there's going to be some pushback, that there's going to be some questioning of why you needed to use the word in its full context in order to get your point across. But but I also wonder then about the, uh, I guess we'll call it the chilling effect on other people. And as I said earlier, whether they feel like they ought to be wading in on this conversation or better to, to sit it out. And what happens if white people sit out the conversation? I think that's kind of where we are today, isn't it? I think for a lot of white folks, the first step would simply be, if you're nominally conscious, is that when somebody in your presence starts with some of the stereotypical language to simply say, I don't want to hear it. Don't talk like that in front of me. That takes a lot of personal courage to get to the point of being willing to acknowledge that you're hearing um, racist m m language and that you're not uh, not going to give it a sly, a pass. Is a, is a huge step. We have a long way to go. And we've been talking about these issues for a long time and things, things move forward and then they move back. So do I think that progress is continuous and that we're going to keep getting in a better position? No, I think we're gonna go forward and then we're gonna go back. We saw Barack Obama and then we had Donald Trump. So we know we take four steps forward, we take two steps back, we gotta take another six forward to get to where we were going, you know? And I think that's gonna continue to happen. But I again think that these conversations are about how do we get along individually, but it is the larger conversation is about getting white folks to realize how they have benefited from so many of the structural things that this country was built upon and how it continues to benefit them in ways that, 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 that they may not be conscious of on a regular basis. You know, there was so much more to my conversation with both Portia and Sheila, and you can watch it all on our website at clickondetroit.com. Diversity can be a problem in leadership roles, and sports is no exception. Coming up, a closer look at how Detroit's professional teams are bucking the national trend in their front offices. I'm Everett Casimi. Coming up, as we continue to celebrate Black History Month, I'm going to take you inside of this iconic Detroit landmark and show you how they're expanding on Motown's legacy outside of Hitsville. Don't step back, step up, and believe in yourself, and believe in what you're doing is um, a value, a value to you and a value to the society. The Motown sound, Diana Ross and the Supremes, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, Martha and the Vandellas, so much success out of Hitsville. We might forget it started like many black owned record labels struggling to succeed. How could it have struggled with that roster that you just read? But of course, Barry Gordy wanted to make music for the world and he did so at the height of the civil rights movement. Our Everett Casme shows us how Motown is focused on the next generation of artists too. This is the home of Barry Gordy's Motown Records, now the Motown Museum. Motown Records broke racial barriers and is the most successful black owned record label, encouraging entrepreneurship and ownership when it comes to music. Today, Motown Museum is encouraging the next generation of artists. You know you in 2021, Motown to me is all about inspiration. It's the music that not only inspires, but has transcended time, created right here inside of Studio A. The Motown Museum keeps the stories of what happened here alive, spearheaded by Robin Terry, the great niece of Motown Records founder, Barry Gordy. My uncle, he's, he's proud of the work I do. He's proud of, you know, me. Robin and her team at the museum have expanded on Motown's story. More than a museum, today it gives young talent a chance to be heard. So Amplify is an amazing platform for emerging artists. And it was only natural for us, um, you know, at Motown Museum, that that's our mission to create these platforms for emerging talent to not only be cultivated, but to shine. If you believe in things you don't understand, and you Now in its third year, the singing competition puts the spotlight on the next big voices out of Detroit. Brittany Hayden was the winner in 2020. To have that, that machine 
on you, you know, connected to your name is just, uh, that's something big in itself. Also as big, the $2,500 cash prize, studio session to record new music and future performances. Our cornerstones, our talent cultivation and entrepreneurial cultivation. Mm -hmm. We want to create more entrepreneurs in the world of color, particularly. And we want to cultivate more talent in this community. Other programs furthering that effort include Motown Mike, a spoken word competition, a summer songwriting workshop called The Lyric Project, and two summer camps for kids called Spark and Ignite. We work with young children who are aspiring artists, but we help them to understand the value and the level of empowerment that comes from ownership. I pray that my grandmother would be extremely proud um, not only of my work, but the team that we have here and the work that we do to keep the story of Motown alive, we have honored that. You know, the Motown Museum is working on a $50 million expansion project to help grow its education and its resources for budding artists and entrepreneurs. An exciting new yeah. chapter coming for Motown. Really awesome. Well, professional athletes make millions, but that hasn't always been the case. There's one player they all have to thank, but chances are most don't even know his name. And an eye-opening look at systemic racism and our prison system. We'll be right back. When you hear calls for the end of systemic racism, that means structural racism, systems with housing, education, health care that create and maintain racial inequity for people of color. Another system that is included in all of that, of course, are prisons. The United States has the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world, yet we represent only about 5% of the global population, but a whopping 25% of the prison population. Our Victor Williams shows us how the legacy of slavery and racism in this country contributed to this. The 13th Amendment is thought to have abolished slavery, but it actually, in a sense, solidified it with a loophole that allowed servitude to people who were convicted of crimes. This was largely used as a means to control newly freed slaves, and it has evolved into what we call today the criminal justice system. Remember, southern states relied on slavery for their economic system, and once it was abolished, they still needed to find ways to make up for the loss of free labor. So what did they do? Those states revised their slave codes and created black codes which made various acts illegal if the individual charged was black. Things such as possessing a firearm supposedly a Second Amendment right, or arresting a black man for not having a job. This often forced former slaves to take a job with their former owner. Eventually prisons were built and started earning massive profits, upping the demand for the commodity of free black labor. This supply will be further ramped up by Ronald Reagan's war on drugs, Bill Clinton's three strikes law, and unfair sentencing guidelines. Since 1970, the incarcerated U.S. population has grown by 700 percent. 700 percent. There are 2.3 million people in prison, and blacks are incarcerated at more than five times the rate of whites. The system of mass incarcerations has handcuffed the black community's potential by destroying family structure, economic growth, and other liberties normally associated with freedom. Just last month, President Biden ordered the Department of Justice to not renew its contracts with private prisons. The president called it the first step to stop corporations from profiting off incarceration and his administration's plan to address systemic problems in the criminal justice system. While the majority of players in the NFL and NBA are black, the front offices are not, though that is not the case in Detroit. How the Motor City is leading by example when history for all continues. I do think there's an important role for me to play, and I do uh, understand how important it is for women, for young girls, for, for African American children, for minorities in general to see people of color in positions such as this. Professional athletes are paid hundreds of millions of dollars, but it hasn't always been that way. And really, they have one man to thank for it, and most probably don't even know his name. In 1969, 
Kurt Flood, all-star outfielder with the St. Louis Cardinals, challenged baseball's reserve clause, which for almost 100 years had said teams owned their players. The only way a player could leave was to retire. We're not a, a consignment of goods. We're not a, a used car. You know, we're people. We're human beings. And uh, I really don't think that any man should be able to own another man. Flood's challenge went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where he lost, and the baseball owners held firm. Kurt Flood's career and personal life were ruined. He became a constant target of death threats, but his battle had opened the door to revolt, and a few years later, free agency was born. Kurt Flood died of cancer in 1997, two days after his 59th birthday. Every athlete making millions of dollars can thank one brave pioneer, Kurt Flood. Moving now to football, more than 70% of NFL players are people of color. In the NBA, that number is even higher. And yet, those at the top oftentimes do not look like the players they lead. Here in Detroit, both the Lions and the Pistons have black men in prominent leadership roles. Jamie Edmonds has more from both teams on bucking the trend. How's everybody doing? The Lions hired Brad Holmes in January. In his introductory press conference, I asked him about his new role and the very small group he's joined. I hope that I can be that same symbolism of hope for younger kids, black and brown kids, that can look up to people like myself. There were seven open general manager positions this year. Three of them went to black men, which more than doubled the number of minority GMs in the league to five. Holmes is honored considering his dad's background as a player in the league in the late 60s and 70s. Stereotypes regarding race because he was a black offensive lineman. And he told me about he kind of related it to offensive linemen or quarterbacks. He says, you know, when I was playing, you know, people didn't think that, you know, Black should be on the offensive line or at the QQB position. Now Mel Holmes' son is leading the Lions' rebuild. Brad Holmes says more work needs to be done league-wide from the top down. We need to continually to put more effort and to improve the that diversity right up under the GM level. So when I look across the league, I see that there's less than 10 people of color that are at the director of college scouting role. There's less than 10 in the league that are at the, uh, if you want to call it the assistant GM role or whatever that number two position is. So to add more diversity to those levels to make the pipeline even stronger, I think will be definitely a step forward. Roughly 75 to 80 percent of NBA players are black, and yet only nine of 30 teams are coached by non-white men. Here in Detroit, the Pistons have black men in both of the top roles. The hiring process throughout the Pistons organization um, has been second to none when it comes to diversity and inclusion. It's a philosophy that stems from the top. Owner Tom Gorris and the rest of the ownership team prioritize diversity and inclusion as a primary component at the beginning of the hiring process. Troy Weaver was hired as general manager in June of 2020. Tom came out and put the money where his mouth is. He he stood behind it. Weaver's hire was just the beginning. He then hired Britta Brown, a senior director of basketball administration. She's an African-American woman. He hired Michael Lindo as director of player and family engagement and Harold Ellis as pro personnel evaluator, both black men. You can't get hired if you uh, aren't in the pool. You can't make progress uh, unless you're part of the conversation. And um, I've seen um, those things growing. The culture at the Pistons is well known and well received. Free agent Jeremy Grant recently told the Athletics James Edwards he wanted to come to play for people in leadership positions who look like him and share similar experiences. It starts with Tom and you know he's on the cutting edge and Arn is on the cutting edge of trying to have a diverse organization as is the NBA. Representation matters. And look no further than Detroit's NBA and NFL teams for examples. Of course, the Lions filled their open head coaching job with a former Lion, Dan Campbell, and he then put together one of the most diverse staffs in the league. Offensive coordinator Anthony Lynn, defensive coordinator Aaron Glenn, assistant head coach and running backs coach Deuce Staley are all men of color. 
That's a lot over this past 60 minutes, but we hope that we've given you a lot to think about. A lot to think about and a lot to continue the conversation because exactly. it's so important for progress. We thank you for joining us for History for All. Local 4 remains dedicated to focusing on the different voices of our nation. And we continue to celebrate Black History Month. Look for our special section of local change makers and historical landmarks on clickondetroit.com. Thanks so much for being here. Have a good night.